I like to think of this as sort of a cooking presentation, right? We're going to be talking about what the ingredients need to be to teach data science in K-12 classes. I've worn a lot of different hats in my life. I've, uh, I've been a computer scientist and professional programmer, as John told you. I've been a, uh, a math teacher right here in Boston. Um, I've had the incredible privilege to work alongside giants in the field like Sriram Krishnamurthy and Kathy Fissler on a research project called Bootstrap based at Brown University in the field of computer science education. And most recently, I've donned a hat as the father to the coolest girl in the world. I promised Maya she'd be in here. And while I would love to spend the next nine and a half minutes giving you a TED Talk focused on her, instead, we're going to focus on something slightly less interesting, which is what's going on in the cutting edge of computer science research. Let me take you back a ways to about 10 or 15 years. Remember when everybody was saying, CS for all, CS for all, we got to get coding into schools, right? At the time, we made a very controversial bet at Bootstrap. First, we said, you know, we don't think siloed classes are the only way to do this. In fact, they might not even be the best way. Second, we gambled on the idea that we could fuse computing and mathematics authentically so that instead of undermining the math, the computing actually reinforced it. And third, we bet there was a way to do this so it worked equitably for all students. So uh, fast forward a little bit, this curriculum sort of busted out of the lab and became one of the most widely used computing curricula nationwide. And while we're thrilled with our scale, we're proud of our diversity. And the reason that we have those numbers is because we're working with the teachers that already reach every child. Not the computer science teachers, but the mainstream math teachers who have no computing background at all. For them, it was just a powerful way to teach mathematics. Now, we didn't want to be one-hit wonders, right? So we rinsed and repeated the formula and extended this for things like algebra, physics, and beyond. And about a half decade ago, we started getting really excited about something that nobody was terribly excited about, which was what if you could teach data science in K-12? Fast forward to today. It's not CS for all anymore, it's data science for everyone. And they're asking the same questions that we asked 10 years ago. What should these classes look like and where do they fit? Curriculum design is essentially a recipe, and every recipe has room for flexibility. Your cupcake might involve cream cheese frosting, and your cupcake might involve you know, coconut shreds or something. Maybe not coconut shreds, I wouldn't put that on you, but there's room for flexing with these ingredients. But one thing we can all agree is that if you leave an ingredient out completely, well, it might be delicious, but you haven't baked what you set out to bake. So the question becomes, what are the must-have ingredients for a responsible K-12 data science class? Now, the prevailing wisdom is that we can all agree on at least two ingredients, mathematics and computing. And when I say computing, I mean programming, algorithms, structured data. And for you data scientists out there who may not be familiar with the K-12 math standards, those are the standards that cover the statistics content, right? The concepts that are necessary for rigor. Those are the standards that cover the data visualization, right? It's those standards that talk about histograms and lines of best fit. What we're hearing, and this is sort of like the loudest voices in the room, is that the solution, here we go, the solution is we're going to take stats classes, right? Thank you, R.A. Fisher from 100 years ago. We're going to add some coding and boom, We've baked ourselves a data science class. And therefore, we should elevate statistics to be just as important as calculus. Now, as a former math teacher, I am all about elevating statistics to be just as important as calculus. I think it's great. But if our goal is to bring data science to K-12, I'm here to tell you that this formula is dangerously flawed. Imagine an amazing CS class. Kids are building virtual worlds and 3D games. And at the end of the class, they spend like two weeks being given a calculator, and they're taught which stats buttons boop, 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 to press to do some statistics. Is that a data science class? Obviously not. Now let's flip that. Suppose you have an amazing statistics class, totally awesome, and then at the very end, we're going to have two weeks where they learn what commands to type into Python. Boop, 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 boop. Also, not a data science class. And as a team that's been working on this for the last 15 years, who knows something about combining math and computing, we know it's not that simple. What you need to do, if you want to mix these ingredients, is find the computational concepts that bridge these worlds. There's a lot of them. I'll just give you three quick examples. How do you take a complex problem, break it down into simpler pieces, and know that when you've solved those pieces, you've actually solved the original problem you set out to, to answer? How do you trust a computation that's been performed on a data set with 10,000 rows that nobody could possibly check by hand? And how do you ensure that your results are reproducible, that anyone else could take your data and your code and see the same results that you did? 
These concepts were critical to our success over a decade ago, and they're just as critical now. And recognize that if you're still thinking that what's necessary is just teaching some coding, it doesn't touch any of them. But it actually gets worse, because there are two other ingredients that are often left out of the conversation with disastrous results. So I call this when data science goes bad. This may come as a surprise to many of you, but we live in a society that's kind of racist. And when you do data analysis on that data, guess what models and algorithms come out? Kind of racist ones. And this isn't just an isolated headline, right? This has become essentially an epidemic where the darkest and deepest divides in our society are being institutionalized in code, affecting everything from medical care to sentencing guidelines. And racism is not just where it stops. Political consultants are mining voter data and everything else to build tactically precise gerrymandered districts that serve to further deepen the polarization in our democracy. And of course, we all talk about how important it is for students to learn about cybersecurity, right? We got to teach them what a good password is, teach them not to hand out that password. And yet, what we really need to be doing is teaching them enough data science to understand why they should not be filling out that survey that tells them which Harry Potter character they are most like. Because it turns out that when you mine that freely available data on social media, it can be weaponized to shift public opinion about issues as major as the fracturing of the European Union. Brexit itself. So why are these being left out? Well, because just teaching math and computing doesn't get the job done. There's two more ingredients that need to be part of the conversation that are always left out. The first is civic responsibility. So let's talk about civic responsibility. Uh, if you're viewing this as math and code, great. I'm sure you'll tell students the dangers of taking a biased sample. But what we need to be doing is teaching students the dangers of a good random sample taken from a society filled with bias. If you're thinking of this as just math and code, well, great, I'll teach you the algorithms to help you aggregate data to predict human behavior and find out which of you in the crowd are most likely to commit a crime. But without, what we need is civic responsibility that says whether it is ethical to ask that question or gather that data in the first place. Now, again, if the strategy is we're going to put it all on math teachers, are they ready to have this conversation? And if they are, is it fair to demand that it falls solely on them? I don't think so. When you teach medicine without civic responsibility, you get the Tuskegee experiments. When you teach data science without this ingredient, you get racially biased algorithms and weaponized social media. The next ingredient that we need to consider is domain investment. Because I could be the most incredible programmer and statistician you've ever met, but if I don't know anything about baseball, I cannot go down to Yawkey Way and analyze sports statistics for the Red Sox. So imagine if a teacher decides that her kids are going to analyze a data set about the best vineyards in Tuscany. Which students are engaged? <laughs> Which students feel included? Which students feel left out? It turns out that the choice of data, the actual investment in the domain, is a critical component, not just of engagement and relevance, but also of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've got a paper coming out of this research group that talks to specifically about this in a couple of weeks. So what we need is to have teachers who can speak to the content areas that matter to kids and meet them where they are. Again. Is it fair to put all of that on the math teachers? Disrespecting the domain expertise of humanities folks has been standard operating procedure for the STEM world for too long. We cannot afford to repeat that mistake. So I'm excited to share with you some of the research results that we've had here. Currently, we've got a curriculum that is in use around the country. Right now in the nation's largest school district, New York City, we've got social studies teachers having kids analyze the stop and frisk data set, teaching social studies in a revolutionary new way. Out in Arizona, we've got physics teachers who already had their kids gather experimental data, but now their kids can analyze the data and try to figure out what kind of equation models what I'm seeing. And they can figure it out before they even see the equation in the book. Students in California are looking at climate data. You can have students in a phys ed class analyzing their free throw percentages or in a nutrition class looking at their snacking habits. This can be a full court press, and it's happening now. Where I want to leave this talk is by saying this notion that mixing math and coding is easy is flawed. But even if you do it right, leaving it at math and coding is fundamentally dangerous. For those of us who care about data science, if the headline becomes it's the new math 2.0. We are sunk. 
This needs to be an interdisciplinary solution, a full court press that engages teachers across grade levels and across disciplines. We need to make sure these ingredients are part of the conversation. We need to make sure that we're not just picking tools because they're free or because they're popular, but that we're choosing a tool that is appropriate for the learning goals of the subject and for the cognitive demands of the students. We need to make sure that we're not just dumping kids with more data sets. We need to make sure they're actually better data sets. Are they engaging? Do they meet kids where they need to be? Do the columns of your data set, actually, are they accessible? Because if it takes a student a week to learn what a data set is even about, we've lost. And finally, because we believe in this so thoroughly, we think it's important to make it free. All of our curricular materials we're giving away in the hopes that all of you out there will join us and engage teachers from across the discipline to make data science real, but also make it responsible. I'm fortunate enough to work with an incredible team, and I want to thank all of you for your time.